A permutation is a circumstance where the order in which we select the items matters. Or in other words, you can have the same subset, but change the order, and that's going to be considered a new outcome. And so an example of this would be if you've got people running in a race. If it matters who finished first, second, or third to get gold, silver, and bronze, then you could have the same three people shuffle their order, and that becomes a new outcome. But if you compare that against a circumstance where you take those th same three people and you say this is a semifinal race, and so the top three advance to the finals, now it doesn't matter what order they finish in. So that's the difference between a permutation and a combination. So for the permutation formula, we see this NPR format where we've got n factorial in the numerator, just like with the combinations. We have n minus r factorial in the bottom, just like with the combinations. But what's missing is the extra r factorial. And so that extra r factorial in the denominator of the combinations formula is what accounts for removing all of the shuffles of the same group of items. So by eliminating that from the denominator, we're making the denominator smaller, which means we're increasing the number of outcomes. So in the first circumstance, how many ways can six different books be arranged on a shelf? So this is a circumstance where you have six as our n, and then since the order in which we place the books on the shelf matters, we're talking about a permutation, and then n minus r, so our r value is going to be six as well, since we're going to be choosing all six. So we get six factorial over six minus six factorial, so we're going to get 6 factorial over 0 factorial, which again we've established equals 1 in order for these permutation and combination formulas to work. And so we're going to get just 6 factorial, so 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, which if we push buttons on our calculator, ends up equaling 720. Now what happens if we're going to take just five of those six books and arrange them on the shelf? Well, our n is going to be six. Our r this time is going to be five. We're going to get what might be a surprising result until we think about it a little bit. So in our numerator, we're going to have six factorial. In the denominator, we've got six minus five. So we've got one factorial, which of course also just equals one. So we're ending up with just six factorial over one which means we're going to get the same answer. So why would we get the same answer in both of these circumstances? Well, in the end, does it matter whether that last book that's left out is on the shelf with the rest of them or if it's sitting on the floor? No. Where it starts to make a difference is if we have more than one book that's being left out because now while the order of the items, the books on the shelf matter, the books that are on the floor, the order in which those are piled up doesn't. So now we would start to see a difference in our answer. But as long as there's only one book or no books left out, then the order of the, that extra book doesn't play a role. And so that's why we get the same result. So now we complicate things a little bit by having six different types of history books, four different types of math books, and three different types of science books. So we want to know, first of all, how many ways can all of the books be arranged on the shelf? So in this first circumstance, we don't care about grouping the history or the math or the science books like we do when we get down here. So we're just going to take 6 plus 4 plus 3, so we're going to have 13 as our n. Now the order in which we put the books on the shelf matters, so we're going to be choosing all 13. So we're going to end up with 13 factorial over n minus r, so 13 minus 13, 0 factorial. This ends up being a gigantic number, 6,227,020,800. So it doesn't take long for us to blow up to a gigantic number if the order in which we select the items matters. For the second part, now we want to arrange these books by subject. So we're going to look at the individual groups of books and find the permutations within those. So we'll take the history books first. So we've got 6P6 times, now we take the four math books. So we're going to have a 4P4 because we're selecting all four of the math books, just like we're selecting all four, six of the history books. And then we've got the three 
science books. But then we also have one more element uh, to the problem that we have to consider. So this assumes that we're going to go history, math, and then science. But what if we shuffled the order of the groups? So the books have to stay within their groupings, but the grouping order can change. And so that means we have three subject areas, and we're going to be picking all three of those. So we can make those look like threes. So we've got an extra 3P3 because we have to be, account for the fact that we're going to shuffle the groups of books. So in the end, we end up with 6 factorial over 6 minus 6, which is 0 factorial. So all of these are going to have a 0 factorial in the bottom, and so then it's just n factorial over 0 factorial for that n minus r. So 6 factorial times 4 factorial times 3 factorial times another 3 factorial. And so if we push buttons on our calculator, we get 622,080. So in the next scenario, we have 11 starters on a soccer team are going to be selected to fill the 11 spots on the field. And so in this case, to start off with, we have no restrictions on who plays which position. So that means from a pool of 11 players, we're going to pick all 11. So we're really just looking at an 11 factorial over 11 minus 11, zero factorial scenario. So just 11 factorial, which is, again, a gigantic number, 39,916,800 ways that we could pick a starting lineup where we're shuffling around who's playing where. Maybe player number one is at goalie, the first scenario, and then they're at left back, the second scenario, and then they're at center forward in the third scenario, and so on. So we can keep on shuffling those 11 players around the different positions, and so then we end up with this gigantic number. In our second scenario, now we have a couple of restrictions that we're placing on us. So number one, we want all of the scenarios where Keeper Kendra is going to be chosen to be the goalie. So that means for that one position, we can think of that as kind of being one possible group of permutations. Then we want either scoring Sally or Choker Chelsea, hopefully it won't be Choker Chelsea, chosen to be the center forward. So then there's kind of a second positional block that we want to look at and all the possible ways that we can choose to fill that spot. And then we've got everything else. So going to the goalie, to start off with, we have one person that we want to choose from. That's Keeper Kendra, and we've got one spot that we're going to fill. So we've got one P1. Then for the center forward position, now we've got Sally and Choker Chelsea. So we've got two people to choose from, but we're only going to pick one of them. And now for all the other spots on the field... Well, there's 11 players on the field at a time. We've picked a goalie. We've picked a center forward. So that means we have nine spots still to fill. So we have nine players still left available. And so even though we had two to choose from for the center forward, we only picked one of them. So we still have the full complement of nine players available from which we're going to pick nine. And so this translates into factorial expressions. Well, 1P1 is just going to be 1 factorial over 1 minus 1, so 0 factorial. So that's just going to equal 1. For the second part, we've got 2 factorial over, and then N minus R, 2 minus 1 is 1 factorial. So that's just going to equal 2. And then we have 9 factorial over 9 minus 9. So again, we're seeing that 0 factorial. So we've got 1 times 2 times this 9 factorial, which in the end gives us 70, 725,760 starting lineups. So just as soon as we start to bring in some restrictions, we can see our answer shrinks significantly. One special situation with permutations is when some of the elements that you're choosing are identical. And so in a circumstance like this, where we're choosing all n elements, so we're not choosing a subset, but we're choosing all of the items n, we divide by however many alike items there are factorial. 
So if we have p that are alike, so there's three items that are alike, we would have a 3 factorial on the bottom. If we have four that are alike, we would have a 4 factorial on the bottom. And if we have multiple groups that are alike, then we have, end up with multiple factorials. So let's see what this looks like in practice. So we've got seven kids in a preschool class, so our n equals 7 in this case. But we've got three of the kids that are identical triplets wearing the same clothes. And so if we've ever known any twins or triplets, we know that they have no individual identities and we look at them all the same. So that means for the number of ways that we can uh, have these students line up for recess, we're going to have a 7 factorial on the top. Again, we're assuming we're choosing all seven items here. And then in the denominator, since we have three of the kids that are identical, we're going to have a 3 factorial on the bottom. So if we reduce this, the 7 factorial and the 3 factorial leaves us with 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 on the top with the 3 times 2 times 1 canceling out with the 3 factorial on the bottom. And so we end up with an answer of 840. A more common type of uh, example of this sort of question is when we have all of the letters of a word and we want to figure out how many ways we can rearrange them. So in the case of the word calculus, we've got eight letters, so our n equals eight in this case. And then we look to see how many of those elements are identical. Because if I was to just swap the two c's right here, it wouldn't look any different. So the way we account for that is similar to what we did just a moment ago, where we're going to divide by however many repeat items we have factorial in the bottom. So we've got two C's, so that means I'm going to have a 2 factorial on the bottom. We also have two L's in this word, so I'm going to have a 2 factorial for that. And then we have two U's in the word, so we're going to have a 2 factorial for that. So in the top, we have 8 times 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, and 2. On the bottom, we have 2 factorial, which is 2, and then a couple more of those. So now we can reduce 2 times 2 times 2 equals 8. So I can go ahead and cross out the 8, leaving me with just that 7 factorial, essentially. And so we get 5,040 as the number of ways that we can rearrange the letters of the word calculus, taking out for the fact that we could swap just two of those identical letters, and it wouldn't look any different.